Welcome back to another Monday, the best night of the week. That means it's time for RFRX. I'm your host, Kara, and I have with me here our most bestest specialist psychicist sidekick, <laughs> Helen Green. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Kara? It's Monday. It's Monday, my favorite day. What have you been up to lately? Um, well, I missed last week because I was in New Hampshire visiting my family. So that was really nice. Yeah. I got to see my mama, my daddy, and I ate a lot of food and drank a lot of wine and hung out with my family members it was really nice so but i'm back <laughs> excellent and yeah. we missed you Thanks. glad you glad you got to hang out with them though that sounds lovely yeah so how you doing cara <laughs> i am doing well i am i am still out and about for work but i've got mondays available to keep having it be the best night of the week even though i'm in a different time zone so <laughs> I'll take it. Speaking of different time zones, I'm super excited about our guest this evening who's joining us from halfway around the world. So looking forward to it. And I guess we should go ahead and get started with this evening and hear from all of you fine people. Let me go ahead and launch our poll to get some of y'all's opinions on a few things. Let me go ahead and pop that up there. And I will read the questions out to you as well. So take a few minutes to answer these if you don't mind. The first question is, is there a difference to understanding religion from a spiritual perspective versus an academic one? And the answer choices are yes, no, not sure, and who cares? Uh, question number two, were you ever taught that it is unwise or dangerous to study your religion in an academic setting? Yes, no, or my religion was okay, but just not others. So we'll leave that up for a few minutes so y'all can let us know your thoughts on those topics before we get started on this evening's discussion. So in the meantime, while they're doing that, Helen, do you wanna tell us what we're doing here? What is RFRX? Well, I'm glad you asked, Kara. <laughs> I'm glad you're going to answer. I know. So RFRX is our, is our weekly meetings. We have them every Monday night at 7 p.m. Central and 8 p.m. Eastern. And if you're in a different time zone, I don't know where you are. So that's what I know right now. <laughs> and we have different, uh, we have different, our hosts um, have a guest that come on and we talk um, about different topics topics related to our online the recovering from religion community so whether it's about different religions deconversion process mental health whatever that is we try to give as much information to kind of supplement some of the things that uh, up top of our resources that we have are recovering from religion it is not a replacement for those of you who are in our online community or our support groups um, you'll get to hear about those momentarily. Um, these talks and presentations are aimed to provide good information, advice, and coping skills to our clients and our community. Um, if you have any pertinent questions, inquiries, you think some would be a great guest, please shoot us an email. Um, you can also send hate mail or money <laughs> or both. So feel, feel free to send those right over. Also as well, all of our um, previous RFRX recordings are on YouTube. There's 94 of them on a bunch of different topics on our YouTube channel right now. Um, the, it is a little bit behind because it takes a lot for our team behind the scene to edit these videos. But if you want our most recent episodes, those are on your podcast platforms. We're on Spotify, Apple, Spreaker, wherever you get your podcast. So you can, if there's a topic that isn't on the YouTube channel or you just want to get more stuff into your brain hole while you're jogging or you know um, cleaning up the house or you're on your commute um, you can find them there as well so do you want to tell the people what recovering from religion is cara <laughs> i would love to i'm glad you asked so 
Our mission statement at Recovering from Religion is to offer hope, healing, and support to those who are struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. So that's kind of three different areas of ways that we try to do that. And so I'll describe the first one to you, healing. That is primarily what we do with our helpline. And that is where you can get 24-7 support, either through online chat or on the phone. You can call in from anywhere, from just log in from your computer, and there are eight agents standing by to answer your call and they are not going to sell you anything. They are not going to try and convert you to anything or deconvert you from anything like that. They're there to listen with an empathetic ear. They are trained in doing that. They're not going to tell you what to do, uh, but they will listen to your issues. They're going to be able to empathize and probably refer you to some relevant resources. Uh, They're not going to criticize or anything like that, but they will be able to point you in that direction. And we also have a fantastic library of resources that some of our other volunteers have put together that I have just posted the link to as well, where if you just want to go straight to the source and check out some of those resources, you can absolutely do that too. So the next thing is hope. And the way we do that is mainly through sharing and listening to personal stories. And kind of the idea behind that is that, you know, we're sort of all in this together, even though all of us have had a different life experience and a different journey uh, with our, you know, religious experiences or not religious experiences. uh, But sometimes hearing from other people about their stories and what they've been through and ways that they've been able to cope and everything like that, uh, we can sometimes gain some inspiration or or some hope from getting to hear that. just kind of see what's going on with everybody else and build that sense of community and togetherness. And you can find those stories on our blog or our podcast, which I'm also going to drop the links to here and they'll be in the show notes as well. Okay. So what about support, Helen? Do you know anything about that? I know many things about support, (laughs) especially the, the support that we offer. So If you are a part, if you want to get together with other people that are are going through similar issues, dealing with leaving religion, doubt, non-belief, wherever you are, we offer support, peer support groups. This is not a replacement for therapy or anything else that you might need. This is just a way you can talk to people that are on the same path that you are and are going through similar experiences. Most um, we are now moving into face to face meetings again. So um, when you go to our meetup, when we go to our meetup page, see if your city is having face to face meetings. If not, you can join us online. I run the virtual support group meeting um, with a couple other wonderful people the first Sunday of the month. So and we get people from all over the world. But if you decide that you want to talk to people in your local city, like in Philadelphia, Denver, see if that group, you know, there's a group in your area. Also as well, um, if you happen to live in Denver, but the Philly group is at a time that works for you better, you can go to that group. So, you know, we don't, we're we're not, you know, cityist and (laughs) we will let you out if you're from a different city. (laughs) Also too, um, we are very excited to announce that we have a new LGBT LGBTQIA plus virtual support group chapter. It is on the third Sunday of the month at 7 p.m. Central. So Car is putting up the link for that in there. Um, so if you are a queer person dealing with um, leaving, you know, recovering from religion, that will be a really good resource for you to meet some like-minded people, other queer people that are dealing with their own issues when it comes to na- doubt and non-belief. So so I mentioned a little bit about extra support and therapy. You want to talk a little bit about uh, that, Cara? Yes, absolutely. So uh, like Helen said, we've been talking about peer support, but sometimes you might be looking for more professional support. And we also try to connect people to that as well. And that is why we have the Secular Therapy Project, which is where we help you get connected with a licensed mental health professional. And we currently have approximately 657 therapists 
who have supported over 28,000 clients so far through the Secular Therapy Project, which is a lot. So the way this works is the therapists that join the Secular Therapy Project are carefully screened for a few criteria. First of all, they have to be appropriately licensed in their state and or country where they live, and they have to maintain a secular practice, which means that they're not going to be doing any proselytizing. They're not going to be sending you home to pray about it or advising you to go back to church or anything like that. They're also going to exclusively use evidence-based treatments. So no woo-woo stuff. It's all going to be real medical therapy. So if that is something that you are interested in seeking out, then by all means, check out the Secular Therapy Project at seculartherapy.org and see if you can find someone. Okay. In addition to that, we also have support through our online community. And this is our online platform where you can meet with and talk to other people who might have a similar background to you. And this is not a, a public community. It's not like Facebook or something like that where anyone can join. You have to actually call or chat into our helpline. And once you talk to an agent, if they determine that you might be a good fit for the community or that might be something that would be helpful for you, uh, then they will send you an invitation to your email account. And that's just to keep it you know, safer uh, and more positive for everyone involved. Keep the, the troll situation to a minimum. Uh, well, to, to zero, in fact. Um, so um, that that is a great community to be in where you can find other groups of people. We have different channels uh, in the community that you can join based on your background or your situation. Maybe you are a parent and you're thinking about how do I do parenting, you know, when my partner is religious and I'm not, or you might be a member of the military and that has its own set of challenges, or we have groups for ex-Jehovah's Witness, ex-Mormon, we have uh, LGBTQ community, we have empowered women, all sorts of different groups uh, that you might be able to connect with and, and meet with and talk to other people that might be able to relate to whatever it is that you're going through. So that is a great place to be. And we have also fun sorts of events you can do like weekly Zoom meetings on Fridays and Sundays usually that you can join us. So if you're looking for something to do with other people that, you know, isn't uh, what you used to be doing. Maybe you've recently left a religious community, but you kind of miss getting together with people on the weekend. Well, here's a way you can do that. So call or chat in and see if that might be a fit for you. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is our friends at the Atheist Community of Discord. They are streaming now, or we are streaming now. Nikki is streaming this show to the ACD. I am not good at describing the verbs that are also social media terms. I thought Google was hard <laughs> enough, but um, we're, we're discording. Are, are we discordant? Is that Discord that is the Discord is the platform. It's being streamed yes. on in a chat. The a atheist community of Austin's discord channel right now. <laughs> yes, those words in that order is what we are doing on discord, but that is another platform you can check out and meet a lot of other fun people. So definitely check out that link I just put in the chat. And finally, Helen, what else can people do to get involved? So I'm going to tell you about my favorite thing that we do at Recovering from Religion is that we're all volunteers. <laughs> so every single person, you know, in front of the camera, behind the camera, our agents are all volunteers. We're making all the atheist money. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to make some atheist money and you want to get out and help, you know, help the, your local, help people that are on the journey, you know, um, help be a support system. I can tell you that for me, I've been, I'm coming up on two years in November, um, volunteering with Recovering from Religion, and it's been one of the best experiences of my life. I've formed really wonderful friendships and I've a really good support system everybody kind of takes care of each other you know looks out for one another and also too like i know what it's like to kind of go on this journey and um let go of bad ideas and it feels good to be able to talk to somebody else about you know letting those doubts and letting go of those bad ideas and feelings that isn't going to judge you isn't going to 
put something upon you on how you should think and just help you guide you through that. And I, and by volunteering, you are able to do that or you don't, or like I started off as an agent. Now I'm an ambassador and I do different things for recovering from religion. So if you got a particular talent skill, like you want to look up, you know, find us resources and add that to the page. If you want to, if you want to help um, clients and be an agent and use the chat or the talk line to talk to them, you can do that. Um, if you want to help our IT guys, they're, we're always looking for that. You're good at social media. You want to do that. We will find a home for you. So you don't have to, you know, really talk to anybody if you don't want to, <laughs> but I do, but helping the, cl the clients, ugh. helping the clients is one of the th things that we found that helping people along on this journey is really rewarding and knowing that you're putting your good works <laughs> into something that is beneficial to um, a lot of people. So if you have some free time, it, it we don't require a lot of time. It's like four hours a month, y'all. <laughs> like that's the minimum. But you, but I found like I volunteer more and more of my time um, because of the work that we do and um, all the benefits that come with that. So, you know, if you're interested, you want to become a volunteer, please fill out an application. If you have any questions, um, you know, you can always email us and we'll do the best we can to answer those questions. Or if you got questions right now, put them in the chat and one of the volunteers that are watching the chat will answer them for you because we're awesome like that. So anyway, let's get into the show. Yes, <laughs> that's what we're here for. Cannot wait for this episode. So yeah, so for anybody who's new, um, just wondering what we're doing here, it's not just Helen and me chatting the entire night. I promise we are going to bring on our guest any minute now. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to hear from him for about an hour. We're going to have a discussion. And then after that, we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes of q a and in order for us to have a question and answer session we need questions so if you think of a question that you'd like to ask while the presentation is going on go ahead and type it into the chat and rob has mentioned a couple of times in the chat if you're going to do that it really helps us out if you preface that by writing the word question and then writing your question. And then that way we can collect those uh, during the presentation and the discussion and then have them to ask at the end. And we'll get through as many as we can. Sometimes we can't get to everybody's question, but we'll do as many as we have time for. And then we'll have some closing thoughts by the fabulous Sasha D'Souza, who will close us out this evening. And then we'll turn off the recording and move into our social hangout time, which lasts from basically the end of the show until we get tired of hanging out. Out. And um, that is also another time to ask questions. If we didn't get to your questions uh, during the, the main Q&A, you can, you can hang around and ask questions then and then continue the discussion as well. Um, so I guess we should go ahead and get started. What do you say, Helen? I am in it to win it. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's do it. Well, I am super excited to introduce our guest this evening. Richard Gilver has been having discussions with religious people for 30 years, originally talking to them in the street, then on internet message boards, and more recently on social media. He has studied Buddhist meditation for two decades and took an academic interest in religious scriptures, specifically from Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity around a decade ago. He began as a skeptic educator around two years ago, like many others, taking the opportunity during the beginning of the COVID pandemic to find a new way of communicating with people. And it was around that same time that he began volunteering with the ACA and undertook his degree in religion, philosophy, and ethics, a move encouraged by his wife to formalize his lifelong interest. And today he has his own skeptic show on YouTube, which looks at different topics with a heavy focus on academia, as well as he's the co-founder and co-host of the weekly Skeptic Hangout podcast, and a host on the ACA's nonprofit show. And he has also appeared on several other shows, including being a host on Ethan Michaels, The Perspective, International Freethinkers, We Are Parents, and a guest host on Truth Wanted and Talk Heathen, also shows produced by the Atheist Community of Austin. And we're not done yet. He has also been a regular guest host on the Bloody Good Film Podcast, a weekly podcast that discusses action and horror movies, which even though it is not 
technically about skepticism or anything to do with religion, we, we may have to pick your brain about that too. So just get ready for that. So Richard, welcome. Thank you for being here. I am very, very happy to be here. My, my friend, Helen Green, who you may know, uh, suggested that I may come on here. And I was like, I said yes before the words actually left my mouth. I was that excited about it. <laughs> Yes. And I was so excited too. It's just, yeah, we were, we were joking around about, we had to, we had to twist your arm and we were like, no, that's actually not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said, yes, I want to come on. And I said, yes, I want to have him on. And, yeah. and that was it. That, that was, was it. Our, yeah. <laughs> our lengthy negotiations for making this episode happen. <laughs> so we are super excited and I want to hear all about all of the things. So you are a man of eclectic and very tastes Richard tell us how did you get involved in all of these different projects and podcasts that that's the 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 podcasting I I have no idea about technology by the way <laughs> I'll, I'll just put that out there before we even begin I am um, I, I like many people I've been talking to people for a long 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 time and I've been to the kind of street epistemology before it was a thing thing when I, when I was uh, and I was about 13 or 14 years old and going into you know the the city center on a Saturday afternoon seeing all these religious people uh giving their opinions on the street and with the little uh stalls and things they'd have out and I'd talk to them and uh, it's essentially in a very basic form when you're 13 or 14 year old uh, ask them what they believed and why in a in a very rudimentary way and, and I've always been interested, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid 40s now, so it's a long time ago. Uh, I've always been interested in why people believe what they believe. And, you know, I went through the when the Internet first came along or when I first got access to the Internet, which was a bit after the Internet first came along. Um, as I went, joined message boards and, and things like that. And uh, as you do. Uh, and then I, I got married. Uh, the Internet progressed. It went from message boards to kind of social media, carried on those conversations. And then we were hit by the pandemic. And, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd previously found the ACA uh, through YouTube. And oh. I was liking what they were saying uh, at the time on the, the host they had on there. And I was kind of, I'd, I'd, I think I'd already started volunteering with the ACA uh, as a, a Facebook moderator. And... I was I was toying with the idea of you know do does anybody want to listen to anything I've got to say at all, uh, and shall I start my own show? And there were a couple of other content creators who'd started just before me, and they kind of they'd set up what they were doing, and it was very basic and very rudimentary. But I was loving what they were saying, and I thought, well, they clearly have no technical savvy either <laughs> and they're doing it so i'm sure i can as well and uh, I, I contacted uh, two of these content creators and we actually started a podcast together uh so yeah it, it all started kind of around the beginning of the pandemic and then i got more involved with the aca doing more more and more things with them eventually became a host on the non-profits which i absolutely love and and we have some great uh, hosts on there and some great guest speakers on there as well. And yeah, it's, it kind of all went from there. Yeah, and we are definitely going to be uh, sharing the links to all of these things uh, in in the chat and and in the show notes as well. So a couple of people have been asking in the chat, um, so we're going to do that for sure. But okay, so I know you've probably talked about this a million times, but for our uh, listeners who are perhaps not familiar with with your work and your background, uh, how did all this start? You mentioned you had an interest from a young age uh, in talking to people about what they believed in and why. What sparked that for you? Were you particularly religious when you were younger? How did you get that uh, that interest? I've I've never been a, a religious person as such. I've, uh, I've I've been in a unique position where I've over the years I've been uh, I've been a regular visit to visitor to mosques. I've been a regular visitor to churches and Buddhist monasteries. Uh, so I've I've got a lot of. Uh, friends uh who were i remember one morning i was at work and i start work really early it's like six o'clock in the like five half past five six o'clock in the morning 
and I'd just started work and I got a phone call from a Buddhist monk from from one of the monasteries and it was just like it, it kind of blew my mind a little bit that that had happened and I had all these people around me who were working with me saying what just happened there why did you just get a phone call from a monk <laughs> so yeah it's a but uh, what was the question I've I've distracted myself with my little <laughs> oh, side no. story all good. Yeah. I was just wondering uh, what, what initially sparked your interest in talking with people about their religious beliefs and uh, what kind of beliefs you started with? Yeah. I, I, I don't know what sparked my interest. I think when I was really young, I had like, like a lot of kids growing up in the eighties when like with movies like Ghostbusters and things. So you just, every, I think everybody automatically, and I think a lot of people in Britain still do hold some kind of supernatural belief like that without really thinking about it, like beliefs in ghosts and, you know, it, you know, alien visitations to earth and weird stuff like that. And I think, I think I held those kinds of belief without really thinking too much about it. And mm -hmm. then as I started kind of, getting past 10 which I think is the age you should drop those kinds of beliefs I, I, I started kind of coming out of that thing and and then uh, like as I said meeting religious people was really the thing that like inspired me to th start thinking about it critically because that's really when things didn't start making sense ah okay so you you were then interested in hearing from other people what was what was causing them to continue in these beliefs or or not yeah. as it were and so how did that influence you as as you had those conversations do you feel like that sent you on a particular trajectory or uh changed your thinking at all it it changed me thinking. I, I do a lot of, I, I don't know what the technical term is. I do a lot of self-thinking. -think I think everybody does self-thinking. That's self a particular. So <laughs> uh, like really, really deep introspection uh, uh, regarding questions rather than just like having a conversation and, and kind of being satisfied with a yes or no answer. I was, I kind of mulled everything over. And like each, each conversation I had, I wanted to kind of go into myself and kind of really think it through rather than just being satisfied with a simple answer. Ask myself, you know, Thank is you. there anything to this? Is, uh, is, that's right, is that's this possible? Right. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. And And so at some point this morphed into a decision to formally study uh, religious beliefs. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I mean, that was a long time after. I was about. I, it, it's, it's, it was a weird progression because I got into meditation. I got into Buddhist meditation through martial arts, and oh. and so I had no interest. I didn't really connect at that point the meditation with religion. Uh, I, I had an interest in religion and I had this kind of other interest, but it was more martial arts based at the start. It was more just about, you know, kind of relaxing myself and getting myself prepared uh, f from that perspective. Uh, and I, I don't know how long I'd been kind of doing martial arts when my teacher kind of, because it, I was doing Chinese martial arts and, and the, 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 the inner side of it, the soft side of it is is as important as the hard side of it so and and my teacher noticed that i was interested in in the kind of softer side of things as well and the introspection and so he kind of recommended a, a, a well, it was a chan teacher but that's a chinese form of zen chan is a, is is mm -hmm. the a Chinese name for Zen uh, and he he recommended that I go and see this uh, meditation teacher from China uh, and I kind of did that when I very first began meditation it was very uh, kind of traditional Chinese uh, one master one student uh, oh, wow. thing and it was it was harsh <laughs> you know oh, I'd, I'd really? get a slap around the side of the head if I got a, the answer to a question <laughs> wrong harsh you know it was oh. very much uh, the kind of uh, Mr. That doesn't Miyagi sound very zen. <laughs> no, <laughs> that doesn't sound zen at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was, it was great. I enjoyed it. I was, 
It, it, it was a lot easier than getting getting uh, beaten up in a in a ring doing martial arts. <laughs> you just sit still and get beat up. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so well, I think there's right a kink then. like that. <laughs> I think <so> too. <laughs> yeah, I need to send in a complaint to my Headspace app. I'm like, hey, right. wait a minute, this is far too relaxing. We're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, yeah it was uh that that last he i was taught under him for about a year until he returned to china and then i was kind of looking for more meditation uh outlets uh because i had quite a, a a strict kind of first year oh. and and done quite a lot of deep introspection in that time and i wanted a lot of the meditation classes were kind of I don't want to disparage them in a way, but they were they weren't intense enough. So I uh, I uh, I wanted something that was more traditional, and and I don't know how long it was. It was probably about seven years or so, and that I was kind of going through different meditation groups of different Buddhist traditions, and uh, and that's when kind of when I got interested in the in the scriptures. Uh, because I wanted to, I'd been doing all this kind of meditation side of it, but I wanted to start looking at the at the stuff behind it. So I kind of started getting into the scriptures that way, and then uh, the the Islamic scriptures, and and it was about that time when I kind of started putting together uh, a friend of mine had, around the same time had just converted to Islam as well. So uh, 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 around that time. I, everything kind of the the earlier interest in talking to religious people, which I'd been carrying on digitally on message boards and stuff, and then the kind of the, the more focused side of it with the martial arts and the meditation kind of came together, and that's when I kind of started formalizing it into uh, like any kind of serious study. It still wasn't like academic at, at that point, but it was it was getting a lot more serious then. Okay. And, you know, that's an interesting point that you bring up that we started talking about a little bit in the pre-show, too, that I'd love to hear your opinion on. I, and someone in the chat uh, has kind of asked a similar question. Um, with meditation, it seems like one of those things that some people think of it as religious or spiritual. Some people don't at all. They consider it just kind of like a like a mental health technique um where do you fall on that how do you think of meditation meditation in general can be either of those things uh specifically buddhist meditation is uh, as is buddhist buddhism i think is the most misunderstood religion in the west that we have uh and uh, in lots of aspects from kind of gross aspects to subtle aspects it's very misunderstood uh and it is a religion, and I come a, if if I have any conversations about Buddhism on online, it's usually about people thinking it's just a philosophy and there's no supernatural elements in it, and that's kind of that's what I push back on. And I'm 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 not one of I'm not saying that you're not a true Buddhist. I'm not a Buddhist. It doesn't matter to me. You can you can believe what you want. So I'm not I'm not saying you're not a true Buddhist if you don't believe in the supernatural elements. You could you know one of my very good friends Cynthia McDonald's practices Buddhism without any of the supernatural stuff whatsoever. Uh, that's perfectly fine. But if we're going to go back to the scriptures, the uh, or, you know if you're going to base your Buddhism on what the Buddha actually said and taught um, and the the reports we have that he said then it is most definitely supernatural. It is most definitely a religious practice. And oh. I don't think there's any way of getting around that. Mm. Interesting. So why do you think that is that, that people, especially in the West, spend so much time denying uh, that it's religious? I don't know. I don't think it's always denial. I think sometimes it's just ignorance of the scriptures. Mm. Uh and I, th I think a lot of people come to kind of not just Buddhism, but all Eastern religions uh, from the West because they've come out of, you know, the the Abrahamic faiths and, and they're trying to, they still want that kind of what they consider a spiritual aspect to their lives. 
but they don't want all the supernatural baggage that goes with it. And it's and there are lots of schools now, uh, and there have been for you know a hundred years or so uh, that of of Buddhism that try and get rid of that uh, kind of supernatural baggage, the more Western ones. And you know that's like I said, that's absolutely fine if that's what you want to practice and you identify it and it works for you. That's great. Buddhist meditation is brilliant in and of itself. It's it's when when you start l- looking at the deeper deeper dimensions. That sounds like a a book title. The deeper yeah. dimensions of Buddhist Ooh. meditation. It's a book it's, idea. <laughs> you heard it here yeah, first. Yeah, it's when you get start royalties. getting like more into it that the supernatural stuff has to come into play. The the essential the goal of Buddhist meditation is to stop being reborn. So if you yeah, if, you, yeah, if, I get if to that's Nirvana, not supernatural, man. I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so do good. you think that that's why there's a pushback when especially westerners when you know they want to believe that buddhism is a philosophy rather than a religion because they left like maybe more structured religion and they want a spiritual aspect they don't want to admit that they were placing one set of silly rules for another set of silly rules but this set of silly rules more yeah, in mean, lines of the, want- where they want them to go I don't want to say it's a one size fits all answer because it isn't. Yeah. And there are different, certainly many different aspects as to why people come to it and approach it from that angle. But I think that's certainly, that's certainly one of, from what I've seen, one of the major contributing factors. Yeah. That's interesting. And, and that kind of, I guess, segues very neatly into um what I was going to ask next about, you know, how you got interested in this more serious academic study, but, you know, what you're sharing uh, with us also is coming from clearly a perspective of someone who has studied what the religions are actually teaching, uh, not just, you know, what you picked up at a a yoga class or something, not that there's anything wrong with yoga. But, (laughs) um, But so, Tell us a little bit more about that. How did this end up uh, becoming uh, a serious academic study of of not just Buddhist philosophy, I understand, but um, other religions as well? Yeah, I I just, I really started, as I said, reading the scriptures and wanting to understand more about them. And of it, I I was never believing the supernatural aspects of them. So I wanted to kind of look more at the background and how they were formed and how they came together and, you know, the different, uh, it's very difficult to say Buddhism or Christianity or Islam is a thing because really all of the all religions are uh, there are there are so many different aspects to them that there, there are Buddhisms or there are Christianities because you don't just get you, you know if you look at a, a Southern Baptist that's way 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 different to a Mormon who is self identifying as Christian. And and so you can't, I don't think you can just put an umbrella term on things. And I started finding this out very quick. I found it, I knew this a long time ago when I was talking to religious people in my teens. But when you look at the scriptures as well and see how many ways people interpret the scriptures, that's mm. that's really there there isn't a right way to there's not a right way to interpret a scripture, but more importantly, especially for the atheist community, one of the things I come across a lot in the atheist community is atheists telling religious people that they don't know how to read their scriptures or they're Uh, not reading the Bible uh, right. And there are lots of ways to read it. And there are lots of ways to interpret it. If you're, if you're reading it as a believer, you're reading it completely different to somebody who's looking at the theology and you're looking at it as something completely different to someone who's looking at it from textual criticism and you're looking at it completely differently to somebody who's looking at it from a historical aspect. So there mm. isn't a way to read the Bible there, there are, or, or any religious scripture. There are many, many different ways. And depending on the context of your reading it and, and the converse, that conversation that comes from that will depend on whether you're reading it right or not it's not all about interpretation so the things we can definitively say the things we can de- definitively trace about uh you know the formation of scriptures um the history historical accuracy of them these things the the yardsticks which we can measure them by and that will inform a lot of whether the interpretation side of it is actually accurate or not mm. you're like i can even like 
you know, I can, with my, my background is that I was a former Catholic and even talking to people that are like Protestant or, um, or Southern Baptist or um, even Lutheran, you know, um, and you talk to these people and you, once you kind of start having those conversations about like how they see the Bible versus the way that you see it, it kind of makes you wonder if you're willing to let your mind be open to this. Like, well, maybe this one way is not the only way to be reading this, you know? And I, and one thing like I've learned from that is as a atheist, I don't tell a religious person that they're reading their Bible wrong because if they're grown up Southern Baptist, that's the way they were taught to read the Bible. If you know, if you grew up Catholic, you were taught to read the Bible that way, you know. So there is no right or wrong way to re- to interpret something. <laughs> yeah, there's no right or wrong way to interpret. I think it's perfectly legitimate to tell, uh, and I do this all the time on the nonprofit. So I've got to say this just to cover my own back. Uh, it's perfectly legitimate, legitimate to tell a religious person to actually go and read their text because many of them don't. But that is that is different to the interp- telling them they're reading it wrong. And, mm-hmm. and it's that context which is important, that, that subtlety and difference between uh, them not reading it at all, and and them not reading it in in a way that you don't perceive as being right. Spoken like a true academic. <laughs> Do your homework. <laughs> um, funny enough, the nonprofit show on the ACA is the only show where you actually have to do homework. <laughs> 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 I love it. That's a great point, though, that, you know, it's you're, you're not telling them that they're that they're doing it wrong. You're telling them just just think about it critically first and yeah. then come to a conclusion, which is presumably how how I, I imagine you're approaching uh, all of these texts. Yeah, I, I read a lot of religious texts. I don't know if you can if you can if you listening to this via audio watching it live but if you can see just above my head behind me there's a series of kind of red book spines uh, yeah. Yeah. that entire shelf is the kind of equivalent to the buddhist bible that's how big it is it's 11 times longer than the bible uh, it's called the tipitaka that's the pali tipitaka and it is absolutely huge and and on top of that, there are commentaries and things that were in a few hundred years afterwards. Uh, so the, that's a huge body of work in itself. And if you consider how hard it is to kind of just read the Quran or the the Bible and and get a reasonable uh, kind of academic understanding, that you can imagine how much more <laughs> more it is for that. And I just have my head stuck in books all day, as well as having a young family and working full time because I'm just a glutton for punishment. Yeah, it would seem so. My goodness. Well, yeah, I'm I'm impressed um, with with that number of volumes. I'd be impressed if anybody had made it through that, which I, certainly people have. Um, but I'm curious to know um, in in your journey as as you've been studying all of these texts and everything. It, it sounds like uh, you started out with an interest out of a I don't want to say uh, utilitarian. Uh, place but you were you were practicing martial arts and then came upon this as a part of that practice it sounded like you were practicing to some extent and at some point you kind of made a shift to studying the texts as documents as you know more of an academic pursuit how did that shift your perspective and and what led to that shift uh i I think from from practicing reading them and practicing it was a case of trying to get the background knowledge of to get a deeper dimension of the kind of martial arts and meditation practice um and then the shift came when i just i just wanted to learn more about them it was it was as simple as that because i didn't believe any of the supernatural stuff in them even even when i was reading them from a practical point of view and uh, i think knowing that there was supernatural stuff in there, but there was also some practical stuff in there for, for the, what I was doing. What I wanted to know, kind of sort through the wheat and the chaff and, and get the get the good stuff and find out why it was good rather than, as I said, I've, I've been interested, always been interested in why people believe what they believe. And I think I wanted to, to get through that and kind of, 
get to get to the why is this useful why is this the way this is why is it written in a certain way when was it written and and and, and all those questions were coming up and you know so really the, the only way to answer those is to go to the academic sources because mm-hmm. if you, you know i could have gone to a, a, a tibetan uh, buddhist group and got one answer i could have gone to a, a theravadan buddhist group and got another answer a zen group and got a different answer so really i had to cut all those perspectives out and mm-hmm. and go to the kind of the the academic sources to uh to get that uh, unfortunately in buddhism uh more uh, probably more even so than christianity a lot of the academic sources come from the the practitioners themselves so you've still got an element of that kind of bias coming in there but you know as with any academic work you you've got to try and put your yardstick hat on and and sort through opinion which you know all or even the academic works sorry to tell you really just people who think that uh, skeptics and uh, atheists are perfect even you know academic work is biased to some extent so you've got to kind of try and try and push through that a little bit and and the way to do that in academia is just to you know look at as many sources as possible um so that's something i found in again in the atheist communities they'll be and i was i talk about this a lot so if you've heard me speak before i apologize for repeating myself but they uh i think a lot of people will will push uh pull uh the opinions of people like bart ehrman or joshua bowen who are very 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 good academics uh and kind of say this is the academic opinion but do not discount believing academics there are some very good Christian believing academics out there who write very, very good scholarship. Don't discount them just because they are Christian practicing and you are not, and you're an atheist. That is a really big mistake because some of them are really, really good. And the, the kind of, you've got to remember that academics aren't apologists and why they will have their bias, they will generally speaking not in every case but generally speaking try and separate their bias from their academic work and you know to the point where they will outright say and i've i've heard christian uh, academics say this before this is the consensus agreement it is not one i share and that's fair enough that's yeah. separating your bias mm-hmm. from your academic work where if you, when you move into apologist territory and a lot of apologists have done a lot of academic work, but their focus is my belief is right because, and they're not so, but they know the academia, but they're not so bothered about employing the academia to inform themselves. They're more bothered about using it as a weapon. So and a genuine academic is, you know, listen to them, even if you don't agree with them, because that's going to inform a wider picture. If you live in an echo chamber, you're not going to learn anything ever. You know, that is such a good point. I'm really glad you brought that up because I I do, you know, get frustrated with the apologists all the time because uh, basically what you said, you know, sometimes I feel like there may be a bit of intellectual dishonesty happening in an effort to convince people or make a particular point. But it's not fair then to assume that that all religious academics are operating in that same way. I mean, it's basically accusing them of being, you know, academically or intellectually dishonest, which it would not be fair to paint everyone with that brush any more than to say that, you know, all atheist academics are are always right all the time and, and good intentioned and have no bias. I mean, and that's, of course, you know, silly. Like you said, we're all, we all have a bias. So, that's a really good point. Can you think off the top of your head of any, I'm, I'm a super big book nerd, in case no one's noticed. Um, what are some some academic books uh, that you found particularly compelling that might be uh, presenting a religious perspective? Oh, there's a book called Introduction to the New Testament by John Drain. Is a is a Christian is a very hardcore Christian, but if you uh, if you if 
if you get that book and you get a, a, a book, I think it's got a very similar title by Dr. Bart Ehrman, and you read them side to side, you will find that 90% of the things agree with each other. And that's that's the mark of good, you know, academia, that they will they will agree on the points of uh you know, the consistent points, the 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 points where we've got evidence for, you know, where where the the, the both of those guys look at the formations of the scriptures, mm-hmm. where they came from, the source texts. And if you read those two books side by side, you get a very, very similar, consistent uh, message. And that's that's a really good that's a good sign of a, a good academic when you get two people of such contrasting views, and and they they do have that agreement. They don't agree perfectly, of course, but uh, you know, as as I don't think you'd ever get any two academics that agree perfectly. But no. it, it's a very good kind of that's a that's a test I'd use. That there are lots of good. Uh, religious academic books written by religious believers uh i mean putting me on the spot asking me to <laughs> to pick hey, them that's, out I, that's I, my I can't job. name i can't name them off the top <laughs> of my head yeah that that john drain introduction to christianity is a very, uh, the new testament is a good one he's also written an introduction to the old testament i don't want to kind of big one person up too much but they are they are really really good books yeah, well, so, no, and I, I like that. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Helen. Yeah. So uh, um, kind of, you know, bouncing off of um, that kind of idea, have you, so as an academic and a non-believer, have you had discussions with believers in an academic setting and um, what kind of like conversations have you had and the different perspective that they're, they're taking away from, you know, an academic text that you're learning in class and how those discussions go when they're a believer and you're not like have you had any really interesting conversations uh and get kind of into their brain on what they're thinking about as they're learning more of the rigorous study of religion rather than just reading the bible on sunday at church <laughs> not not particularly from uh, uh from the the perspective of being at university and and learning this stuff because I, I started distance learning because the pandemic had hit. So I've not actually been in the same right. room as any of my fellow students. I'm, I'm entering my third year of my course now. So, and I've, I've not met physically any of my fellow students yet. So oh. uh, mm. that's been something that uh, I've not had the opportunity to do. And when I've, uh, interacted with them online it's been very cordial and we've talked more about the kind of practical aspects of what we're learning rather than any disagreements we might have um we're aware we have disagreements but we approach them very respectfully from from the perspective of in general online uh interactions i don't think i've had much interaction with actual academic believing christians uh who aren't apologists Mm. and I've had lots of interactions with apologists and they go a completely different route because as I say, I don't, they they kind of weaponize academia and, and use it to, to defend the position and and kind of discard that stuff, which doesn't uh, defend the position. I had, I had a conversation about a year ago, I think with a, with a Muslim guy. And we were talking about uh, a particular a book. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it was something to do with uh, textual criticism of the Quran, and uh, it's a really good book. And uh, he, he pointed me to this uh, academic paper that had been written, kind of responding to it from the Islamic perspective. And the first thing it said said in this ap- academic paper was that you can't properly understand the Quran unless you're a believer. So any criticism of it that doesn't come from that perspective can be discounted. And that's the kind of stuff that you you come across quite a lot uh, when you you start talking to apologists. It's very difficult to kind of get round that barrier. Mm, it's it's kind of almost one of those things. I think there was a conversation going on in the uh, the chat a minute ago about, well, we know it's true because the text says that it's true. Well, if I don't believe that premise, we've gone nowhere with that yeah. argument. Yeah, uh, we, but, we can all we can all come from that angle, you know. We can yeah. we can 
I can say that the flying teapot is true because I believe it is true. You know, that's yeah. easy to do. Anybody can do that. It's useless. It's yeah. it's it's useless philosophically. It's it's very often employed in philosophy, but it's absolutely useless just doing that. You know, I'm I'm right because I'm right is fair enough. You you can you can make a a legitimate philosophical claim that you can say that, but it's absolutely useless if you want a conversation with someone. Right. This is the way that you, you know, make your children believe something. Uh, but as soon as they're able to think about it themselves, they, they may not be forced to, to accept that premise any longer. It, it reminds me a little bit of what you were saying earlier. Um, I know when, when you say they, people might weaponize uh, academic work in order to, to use it for, for apologism. I, I know my, uh, I have a family member who's always, you know, trying to to convince me with with new arguments from. Well, they're not new; it's the same arguments from the apologists. But uh, she she got one one time where it was uh, someone citing a, an anthropological source about, you know, mitochondrial Eve, and see the scientists have discovered that there really was an Adam and Eve, and cite an academic article using that term, and of course, that is not at all uh, what that is referring to, um, but. It's almost like a way of of trying to you know hang your argument on oh see this is academic but if anyone were to go and actually read the source like you mentioned earlier they would realize that the academic source does not likely arrive at the conclusion that the apologist is pointing us towards so I'm wondering having you know studied religion you know more intensely now do you have any like pet peeve arguments uh, that people will use or or claims that they will make that are are not in fact <laughs> academically based i think i think my pet peeves are uh i don't think they've changed to be honest with you <laughs> over the years my pet peeves uh, they've just become more intense as i hear people use them more it's it's very uh uh it's very hard when you've been doing this as long as i've been doing this to kind of i try and I try and take conversations on an individual basis and I try and doesn't always work. I sometimes lose my temper. I'm not going to lie and pretend I'm perfect, but I'd, I'd try and come at every conversation with every new religious person I talk to from the perspective of, you know, I want to have a conversation. I don't want to kind of tell you what I think. I don't want you tell me what you to think. I want us to share information. And, you know, my, my focus is not necessarily uh, telling people what they believe is wrong. My focus is uh, kind of getting people to understand that you shouldn't believe something until you've got a good reason to believe it. And, and that's always my focus. That's always what I come back on to. But I think it's very, very difficult when you've been having these conversations, when somebody tells you that the evidence for God existing is just look around you and look at the world around you for the 150 millionth time. And th they <laughs> think it's trees. a unique <laughs> argument that they've just come up with and, and they're sharing this information with you. It's very, very difficult not to get, you know, high rate and frustrated over that to, to, at the beginning of the conversation. It takes a, a lot of my effort goes into not losing my temper with some, because a lot of people, these people legitimately believe this is the case and, and they're coming in and they've not talked to people before and they've not had these conversations before. And you, you don't want to put them off by just shouting, you know, you are wrong at them, you know, it, yeah. and it's very difficult not to do that. Like I said, when you've, when you've, you've been doing this thing for stuff for 30 years and you've had this argument thrown at you for 30 years and then you, you, somebody comes along and they think they're the originator of the argument and they've got a gotcha and yeah uh, yeah so yeah it, it's frustrating lots of arguments like that frustrate me the you know the kind of standard the standard kind of apologetic apologetics arguments yeah uh, I... really frustrate me i like the more subtle things i like the things about uh you know, when people say that the, the resurrection is proof of Christianity and it proves supernatural claims, I like stuff like that, which are a little bit more subtle. You can go into them in a lot more subtle ways. And, you know, 
that's my they're my favorite conversations to have but they're not ones i have very often because you usually like as i say each new person thinks that they've the this age-old argument they've got the Colom cosmological argument is one that really winds me up like really really <laughs> oh, gets under my skin i hate that because argument. it's so it blatantly easy to refute at every stage and people think that they've really really got a new angle on it every time they bring it up that one gets me too it, it it's it it's not new it's not new we, we we've heard that before and it, it it's fails. a thousand years old <laughs> this was in refuted. its modern form <laughs> yes yes it's been refuted thoroughly centuries I, ago I, I can definitely understand that frustration though because i don't like to debate people because i just get frustrated and like i'm not well versed in a lot of these arguments you know so i'm I, and then i'm just gonna get frustrated and start skipping over my words and then um i'm gonna get mad and yell at them and then the theists will be like i won <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, like, I don't want to get into those conversations, but I can understand, like, if you've been having it's and it's always the same arguments, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> it's just the same stuff that always comes back that after a while, I would just be like, all right, fine. Yes. Okay. There's trees. Yes. God exists. Good for it. Great. <laughs> you know, like, like, yeah, well, that, I can't. Uh, the trees look, look exist, at the trees. So you just broke feel God. like saying, so okay, let you have that because yeah. I just can't be bothered to argue against it. Right. I, I think the only time I really lost my my uh, rag from beginning a conversation with someone, I'm not, I'm not going to name the person who called in, but I was hosting Ethan Michael's perspective show once and um, uh, uh, someone who, who kind of does the rounds on the call shows or did. Uh, do the rounds on the call shows called in. I already have like three or four names right in my head right <laughs> and, now. <laughs> and it was the first time I'd ever talked to him. And I, I just, before we even began, I just said, look, we're not going to work from your script. Uh, we're not, we're, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not interested in doing it. If you've got, if we, you want a conversation, we'll have it. But if you're not interested in a conversation, just sling your hook somewhere because I'm, I'm not interested. And, and that was, I think that was the only time, especially on a, on a call-in show where I've really just kind of lost my temper because I knew the reputation of the guy. I'd heard him so many times before I even spoke to him. But I, I, I'm not like that, really. Just people come and talk to me because I do like genuine, nice <laughs> conversations. If you're coming at it from, if you're coming, if you're, if it's blatantly obvious that you you genuinely want this conversation and you're trying to understand and you're trying to learn the, if you, even if you just come out and you want to know what atheists believe because you've not really had a chance to speak to any, you know, I'm more than happy to have a sit down conversation and and talk to you. That, yeah, that's what I want yeah. to do. Well, and okay, I want to get your perspective on this. I always kind of wonder about this. I know with, with the call-in shows, uh, like they have on the ACA and, and the other ones that you've been on, you know, sometimes it's people calling in who are, you know, practicing for their apologetics or something like that. But generally speaking, do you get the sense that, you know, if someone is listening to an atheist call-in show and going to the effort to call in sometimes repeatedly, uh, it seems to me, but I want to know what you think, that that person may actually be questioning and, and wondering if they have the right answer or if there's more to it or not. What's your sense of that? Even the ones that are a bit more combative. Yeah, I, I would always uh, try. And un unless it's a known kind of troll or a known apologist, mm -hmm. I, I would always approach every call like the genuinely one into mm -hmm. and, and whether it's calling show or in in person or on the internet any anybody who's talking to you as though they're genuinely wanting to learn uh mm -hmm. your position yeah uh, and i don't I, I want stress here that i'm not say learn because i'm right and they know they're wrong i mean just no. to genuinely learn the other person's position and and mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about it because that's what we all do that's what i do every day when i read a, a religious text i'm learning the position of those people who wrote that text and yeah. and i think that's very important to do that and i think most people who who i talk to at least do have at least a a hint of that genuineness about them and it's great there's you know i'm i'm in the very lucky position where i've had people turn around to me and you know and write to me and say you know what You've really helped me see a different perspective. And that's, that is the best feeling in the world 
when you get an email like that or if somebody tells you that, that is the best feeling in the world because you might not, you know, I don't go out to deconvert people. I don't care if you want to carry on being religious. My, I, What I want to do is instill better thinking in you. And mm-hmm. if I've done that in even a minor way, which leads you down the road, you know, I, I don't want to deconvert you. What I want you to do is get you thinking about things yourself so that you believe things for good reasons. And then mm-hmm. you do the work and you put the effort in and whatever conclusion you come to from that is, you know, good on you as long as you've done it honestly and, and, and put the work in. Yeah. Well, and that, that benefits everyone then when, you know, people are out thinking about other perspectives in a clear headed kind of way that maybe they will come up with a new version of the Kalam argument that works better. I mean, who knows? <laughs> maybe yeah, not that in particular, that. but <laughs> something else <laughs> was there ever a conversation that you particularly particularly had with like when someone called in that made you want to learn go to like a text or something that you had and like learn more like a, heard, heard something you hadn't heard before that you wanted more knowledge on the i think the only the only call i can and i don't think i actually i was didn't take the call it wasn't a show I was on and speaking to the person, but I heard him on a person. And then I spoke to him afterwards on social media uh, after he'd uh, called in. And I think he's called into a couple of different shows. Uh, was a Raelian guy who believes in the Raelian movement. And uh, 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 that I, I knew nothing about it until this guy called in. So I really wanted to have a look <laughs> into that. And, and, and what and, is that? Yeah, it I was, can it me was, and Carter are the same band. I was yeah, like, what? Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of, I, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact details, so I'm not going to give specific details because I will get them wrong. Uh, it was a, a French guy who I think it was in the 60s or the 70s claimed he'd been abducted by aliens who'd given him all this knowledge and he had it connected to them via meditation and he was the reincarnation of Buddha and they had all these connect these unique insights into all the other religions because these aliens had told him that that was the case. Uh, and I knew nothing about that. It was until I'd heard this call. And I ended up having kind of months of discourse with this really and guy, uh, both publicly on forums and kind of via private messages. And I found it fascinating. Wow. Okay. Well, well, now I'm curious. I'm going to be doing a wiki and probably fall down a rabbit hole later. <laughs> it's not a fun rabbit hole to fall down. <laughs> oh, it's not. Oh, Cam, I like fun rabbit holes. <laughs> Too late. You you know we're both going to Google that later. We are. Yeah. We're going to look at the happen. Notes. Yeah, we're, we're going to do an episode. <laughs> yeah, I, I did a little bit of a deep dive into it because I did a well, on my own uh, show. I did a, a an episode on cults. <laughs> And uh, so I'd kind of heard this guy talk and I did a little bit more digging about them for, for that episode. And, he, you know, his ex-wife, I found a newspaper article where his ex-wife was talking about the abuse she'd suffered through him and things and, and lots of sad, you know, it, sad, sad stories like that. And it, it really just kind of, it frustrated me that, the, you know, the followers of this movement, kind of knew about that and still wanted to practice it and still thought it was okay to mm-hmm. practice uh, the following someone like that uh, you know that that's that's the sad side of uh, as, as you guys mo- know more than mm-hmm. anybody the sad mm-hmm. side of religion is is the harm it causes right yeah and the continuation of that harm because of a, a lack of willingness or or ability or or incentive to look more closely and see or to question yeah that's so dangerous and and that's what i love about you know what you came to talk about you know thinking skeptically or academically about religious beliefs you know it's it's okay to study uh and and think critically at the same time and i love that you you came by that, I would say, honestly, it sounds like from your story, you know, sometimes people will, you know, go get a degree in something in order to refute it or, or argue it or something like that. And that doesn't strike me as as you. Uh, let let me be clear as to why I set out doing my degree. My my wife is 
got lots of degrees. She's very clever. She's got degrees in politics and economics and master's degrees in educational psychology and all sorts of wonderful things that I don't understand. And uh, <laughs> she, she for years, for uh, and uh, at least 10 years, at least 10 years has been saying to me, go, you're, you're really interested in this stuff. Go and do a degree in it. You know, formalize your interest. Get 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 something on paper. Maybe down the line you'll be able to work in the area that you love. And yeah. you know, and I I was just like, no, I'm not a degree kind of person. You know, I I I, I don't want to go as far as to say I grew up on the streets, as that's not true. But I've certainly been in more than my fair share of bar barroom brawls. Let's put it that way. So I never considered myself kind of uh uh you know an academic person. Even when I was doing stuff academically, I never considered myself an academic. I still don't. I still kind of look at myself. I've got a bit of imposter syndrome, I think, when I, I talk about this oh. stuff. So why am I talking about academic stuff? Because I'm not really an academic. You know, I, I think uh, that's uh, a sign that, that you might have become an expert in your field. As soon as you realize <laughs> that you don't know anything about it, it's it's a clue. I'm, I'm certainly not an is, expert yeah. in my field, but no, it was it was my <laughs> wife who pushed me to uh, kind of do this formally and, and get the degree. And I started it like say it was about I'm entering my third year now. So it was about mm -hmm. two years ago. It, all, all, all this started the kind of intense online and, and the, the kind of formalizing and talking to people all started about two years ago. Um because before that, like I said, it had just been done in the street and via message boards and on mm -hmm. social media and things. So uh, the, the pandemic was great for me uh, from that perspective. It was bad for me because I actually got COVID before there was any vaccinations oh. and I'm still having tests because it really badly affected me. Uh, oh. But from, mm. from the from the other side of things it was really good for me and you know, i've met a lot of new friends and got involved in all these different communities because I, I started spending a lot more time online yeah you know i wanted to ask you about that too if you felt like you know after covid uh, that there's been kind of a change in the way that you're able to communicate with people about these kind of questions do you feel like that opened up uh, more opportunities for these conversations for me personally yes i can't speak for everybody I, yeah. I, I was having these conversations, like I said, in the old days on, in, on the message boards when I started using the internet. And then I kind of got married and uh, honestly, kind I got of frustrated kind of with the... <laughs> You kind of got married. <laughs> I kind of got I, married. I, I kind of had kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got frustrated because, uh, not because of the marriage or the children, but I got frustrated because in Britain at the time when I was having these conversations, I saw in the atheist communities, I saw a lot of copycat arguments. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, everybody at the time was just getting into kind of, you know, the God delusion was a big thing. It had come out a couple of years before. And I just saw a lot of parroted arguments. And it was really, really frustrating me. So I kind of left the online talking, still did it in the street when I saw people. But I left the online talking for about five or six years until I kind of started listening to, I came across the atheist experience on YouTube and Matt Dillahunty was saying something to someone. And I thought, I say that stuff. And none of the atheists I've been talking to before say that stuff. So it really piqued me interest. That the, the, I was kind of hearing someone who was on a similar wavelength to what I was on. And that's what kind of got me looking more at the ACA uh, kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I left the online community for about, I don't know how long it was, somewhere between about five and eight years. Because uh, I, I didn't want those conversations with people on the atheist side who were in an echo chamber. I don't like echo chambers. I don't care what side of the argument you're on. I don't mm. want to listen to someone who's in an echo chamber. I want I want someone who genuinely wants a conversation. You know, that is a question that we have gotten from people a few different times before here. And I wonder if you could speak a little more on that. What kinds of things do you do to try and make sure that you're not in an echo chamber? And how do you know if you're in an echo chamber? It's very difficult to know if you're in an echo chamber. Uh, yeah. I think... As, as I said from the beginning of the show, when even from when I first started talking to religious people, I went away and thought about things. 
and then uh you know the meditation obviously helped focus that not obviously because if you don't know anything about meditation you might not know that but it helped me focus uh i think is is a best way to put it and 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 just kind of deepen that introspection and you know i've no interest in uh, me being right i want to know as many true things as i can know and that's what motivates me not to be in an echo chamber just just to kind of look outside of my own opinion and look at other people's opinions and, you know, try and assess that as best I can. It's always going to be bias present. You can't get away from it with the best will in the world, but Mm -hmm. to to try and put that bias aside as much as possible is, is I think uh, how I try and do it personally. And if I, if I catch myself, sometimes you miss it completely I'm sure there are many, many biases I have I'm not aware of. But when mm-hmm. you, when you catch that bias, then do something about it. Mm, yeah. Rather than just being aware of it and saying, well, let's just shove that aside. We don't need to know about that. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think so too, like for those of us who have left religion, because your religions are, are very biased and you think that once you leave religion, you let go, let go of all the bullshit. You're suddenly not biased. Like I have an open mind yeah. <laughs> and nothing, you know, I will never be biased again. And then lo and behold, you found out that, oh, wait, yeah, I am, <laughs> you know. I, I will I, shout yeah. from the rooftop to atheists <laughs> are not skeptics. I, 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 I can argue uh, all day long with atheists just as I can with religious people about right. skepticism. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, thinking, like you said, Helen, you know, thinking that you're, you don't have a bias is the quickest way to start deluding yourself (laughs) into believing your own BS. Yeah. Because I've seen it in the atheist community, as Richard Mm -hmm. said, you know, people Mm -hmm. that think that, you know, there should don't stink. And like, I have all the answers and then, but I'm like, but are you, are you growing? Are you changing your perspective? Mm -hmm. Are you learning? You know, just, you know, and I think that, you know, that's a good lesson for all of us just as, as going forward, that it's okay to be wrong and it's okay to change your perspective and, and to let go of some of your biases. It's okay. Like, you know, that's, that's, you know, evolve people (laughs) evolve. Yeah. 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 Straw manning religious people is just as bad as religious people, straw manning atheists. Right. It it doesn't become right just because you're an atheist. You know, Mm -hmm. if you want to, if you want to create an argument for a religious person and knock that argument down and feel superior and you know i see this constantly almost Mm -hmm. daily uh doing i'm you know one of one of the admins for the aca's many many message boards fan run message boards and you know the amount of people who come on saying listen to my argument isn't it fantastic and and you just kind of think you just nobody has that opinion you're just, you're just arguing against something that doesn't exist. And yeah. it, it happens all the time. It does. And, you know, I think that I've been thinking about that a lot myself, too. And, and I think it does have to do with when we bring in our own bias into things. Like, I grew up personally in a very extremist version of Christianity. And so there are sometimes when I can think about, you know, some of those really silly beliefs and ideas and point out, you know, how absurd that is. And of course, that is, you know, demonstrably false. But sometimes I can even catch myself forgetting that, you know, that's not the position of all Christians. That's not what even most or many religious people think. It's not, it would not be fair of me to think I've now, you know, taken down (laughs) this belief system by, you know, refuting, you know, that, you know, the sun does not revolve around the earth. You know, (laughs) that's that's not a serious argument. Earth is flat, Cara. (laughs) Right. My mistake. (laughs) But, you know, and, and I think we, you know, we're susceptible to that sometimes when we come out of a belief system that was harmful or that pushed certain really offensive and obviously either incorrect or, or immoral or unethical beliefs onto us. It's easy for us to seize on that and go, look, see how ridiculous these belief systems are. But, you know, that that may not really be a genuine reflection of, of what a great many people um, who adhere to those religions really think. So I, I, I caught myself doing it today. Reminder. I was writing, a, I was talking to a Hindu on, on one of the, on the, one of the uh, social media platforms. And 
I, I had to delete my message because as I read it back before I posted it, I realized that what I was saying is you believe this. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I've, why, why am I making that assessment? Because I don't actually know what that person believes. And yeah. so, like I say, I, I do this stuff all the time and I'm prone to it as much as anybody. So, you know, it happens to all of us. As good you, as we think we are. <laughs> yeah, Richard, I'm this. very proud that you read your text before sending it. <laughs> like, like more people need to do that. Me included. Like, well, but I, I have I'm no gonna, choice. I'm going to give if, you if a gold I, star for that. <laughs> if I want to look academic, I've got to do that because my right. spelling is atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true okay so this is really fascinating and we have to shortly start moving towards the q a session but before we we hear some more of your your final thoughts i have a very unserious non-academic question that i have been dying to ask you for the last hour and i'm gonna ask you now <clears throat> are you ready okay my question is which Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle are you, Richard? <laughs> Do you have uh, a favorite? <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to say Leonardo because honestly, it's the only one I can remember. <laughs> okay, well, that's a fair answer. Okay, <laughs> I'll accept that. Helen, do you want to weigh in on this? Um, I didn't watch Ninja Turtles, so Ooh. I don't. But I, um, what is your favorite Monty Python sketch? <laughs> and you're a Brit. So oh. if you don't have one, I'm going to be so disappointed. <laughs> uh, I, I've now that is a that is a good question. I, I think the uh, I think I don't even know which one it's called. There's there's a there's a role reversal one where uh, Graham Chapman plays a playwright who's dressed as a miner with a Yorkshire accent. And I don't remember who the who the other guy in in the sketch is, but he he plays a miner with a southern accent who's got a suit on, and it's kind of a class role reversal thing where the 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 kind of guy with the Yorkshire accent who's dressed like a miner is, is talking about having writer's cramp because he's been at so many playwriting sessions, and and the guy in the suit with the kind of posh accent is talking about working down the pit all the day. And that's a great sketch. I don't remember the name of it, but check it out if you can. It's fantastic. (laughs) Outstanding. All right. Sorry for that that brief brief distraction from our our serious conversation. But we we had inquiring minds needed to know the answer. This is the deep stuff. (laughs) This is perhaps a deepity. A deepity. This is, I mentioned earlier that me and Helen are friends, and this is kind of the level that our friendship is on. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. We both hated the new Thor movie. So, (laughs) and we need to talk more about that in the Hangout as well. Exactly. I I have questions. And and we need to ask you about movies too. I promised we were going to ask you about movies, and we haven't gotten to that yet, but we're going to. Everyone stand by for that. But okay, before we just devolve into, you know, complete and utter nonsense, which, hey, you know, maybe that's what we're here for. Richard, thank you for your comments this evening. Uh, before we go to Q and A, uh, is there anything else that you want to cover that we haven't talked about yet, or any uh, other comments that you want to leave us with? I the only thing I would say, and it, this, this is my thing. I'm a one trick pony. It is. It's really. If you want to talk to me, it's really, really simple. If you want to believe something, if you believe something, make sure that you have good evidence that it's true. You know, something being true in reality uh, can be demonstrated. And if it can't be demonstrated or you don't have good reasons for believing it, then inquire into yourself as to why you believe that to begin with. And and kind of, you have to do the work. I don't want to sound like a, a flat earther saying you've got to go and do the research. But put, put, put the work in and ask yourself, why do I believe this? Because I don't have any good reason to believe it. So why is it that I do believe it and start that journey? Mm. Excellent advice. I appreciate that very much. And we're applying that to ourselves as well as other people. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. 
Uh, before we go to Q&A, uh, and we do have quite a few questions for you that I'm excited about, um, where can people find you if they want to hear more about you and more from you? And I have to say, there are some other people in the chat who are inquiring if you give voice lessons because they want to sound more like you as well. I, I have no idea why anyone <laughs> would want to sound like me. <laughs> they, uh, I, I, uh, I've got my own... Uh, youtube channel called skeptic takeout honestly there's not been that much on it in the past year because the episodes take me that long to write uh, it, it could take me two months to write an episode so and i've been really really busy over the last year so there's very few things on there recently uh, it is still active there will be stuff going up but there's this old content on there you can have a look at uh skeptic Hangout is a weekly podcast that uh, I started and host with uh, three very good friends of mine uh, who were all uh, I met all through kind of doing this kind of work. And uh, we do. I love that because it's entirely unscripted. We pick a topic, sometimes two minutes before we go out, we record it and uh, we'll pick a topic and we will talk about it regardless of whether we have knowledge about it or not. We just try and apply skepticism to it. And that's everything from we've talked about America. We've talked about the monarchy. We've talked about God, aliens, ghosts, the Dead Sea Scrolls, everything in between. We just pick a subject and we go with it. Uh, and we have some. We've had some great guests on there. We've had a, a friend of mine, Doctor Richard Firth, God be here, who wrote a Human History of Emotion. Uh, that's a really, really good book. He's been on there a couple of times. We have Kenneth Leonard, who who does stuff for the ACA. We've had uh, Jenna Belk on there. I think she was one of our mm. first guests. Uh, yeah. So we we have a we've we have occasional guests on there, but usually it's just. Uh, one of the combination of the four of us and and just ad libbing uh the non-profits is another place you can find me which is as helen knows is not quite so free form and you have to do your own work and read read the news articles and write notes that's a, another great platform uh the aca stuff i'm heavily involved with the aca so uh you know go and look at the non-profits you'll be able to catch me doing the occasional talk heathen or the occasional truth one that i've been on both those shows twice i think uh yeah so just just around uh, the bloody good film podcast i'm on all of the month of september talking wrestling movies because one thing we didn't get into is that i am actually an ex-wrestler so what wait um, how did we not get into that we uh we, we have something uh, new invited, about you richard <laughs> they invited me on for wrestle monthia on the blood good bloody good film podcast where the, we're talking about wrestling movies for the whole month so go and check check that out as well i also uh, watched this review to. of the god's not dead movies <laughs> that is the first place yeah. that i saw you actually or heard you was the the reviews of those movies that yes i i enjoyed that greatly because those movies irritate me to no end <laughs> yeah the, the plan is to do the whole series of them i'm here for it i i am here for that I, I mean, you know, it's it's like torture going through them, you know, one by one, but you can't look away. It's like watching a train wreck. So it is. Um, they are their challenge. But it, I feel know. like when you get through one, like you like got a like a notch in your belt, like you, like you climbed like Mount Everest. It's like, OK, yes. I'm like, hey, you did the thing. Yes, <laughs> it's an achievement. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess we should move into the Q&A now, and I think that there will be more questions about this in the Q&A, but okay, let's see here. What do we have? We have a number of questions for you. Are you ready to answer some questions, Richard? Yeah, throw them at me, see what we've got. Yeah, you know, you can decline. It's, it's okay. You know, I'm not sure that's ever happened on here if someone's just said, no, I'm not answering that. I don't think it's ever happened. I don't think that's ever happened. Been doing this. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. So I, I think these will be good. So uh, someone was wondering, going back to the meditation topic from the beginning, uh, what is the difference between secular meditation as opposed to religious meditation? And is there a health benefit? Are there risks involved? Thoughts? Oh, that's, that's a very... Uh 
it's a very good question. It's also a very hard one to answer in a couple of minutes. Uh, gen- there doesn't have to be a difference from uh, uh, the methodical side of it. Essentially, meditation is breathing in and breathing out and being aware of your breath. You don't need any religious aspect to it whatsoever. If you're doing it as uh, part of the Buddhist system, then there are lots of different aspects which are affected by the kind of religious aspects of it that you you take into account and uh, certain states of consciousness that you're told you can achieve and and things like that. So if you if you're aiming for them, there are certain uh, practices to do to try and to try and get there. So it, it, it is affected by it. Health, health benefits. Yeah. They can, it can make you certainly make you calmer, make you more grounded, settled It's very, very good. It can, it can, it can really help you uh, kind of settle down. One thing I, and I, I've not done any academic research on this, so I don't know what the academic uh, thing is from the Buddhist perspective. People who have, uh, who, who may be prone to kind of mania and things like that, or or, or different mental health conditions, it, are said not to that they shouldn't do it because to to kind of get the get the full religious benefit out of it, um, you, you're supposed to be able to be in a place where you're grounded to begin with. It's not just a case that you can, this is scripturally, this is not me talking. I'm just talking from the, from the scriptural perspective. Not supposed to just walk into it and start doing it without some kind of uh, like grounding to begin with. Um, uh, but I, I don't, there've been lots of studies on it and some of them are a bit dubious. Uh, some, I, I'd, I'd said, I'd say it's more beneficial to do it than not do it. Uh, that that's I'm not a medical person, so I don't want to go into. I don't want to give medical advice, but I certainly, I certainly think in general, uh, it'd be more beneficial to have five or ten minutes meditation a day than not to do any. It'll it'll ground you and calm you down and kind of all that good stuff. It has done for me. So that's without giving medical advice. That's my experience of it. So I assume other people, because I'm not in any way in unique as a human being, will have the same experience. Fair enough. Disclaimer, we do not give medical advice on this channel. All comments are people's own opinions. <laughs> do your research. Do your homework, not do your research. <laughs> do your own research for just watch youtube research. videos yeah, <laughs> that's no. all the research no, it's not what that. we are advocating <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that <laughs> oh good times all right helen would you like to uh give us another question yes i would so um so by setting so-called holy writings free from any preconceived biases did that help you uh, help you apply your critical thinking skills yeah, I think it did. I think uh, because there's some stuff in there which is obviously bullshit. And I think, <laughs> I think we're, we're, if you're not indoctrinated into that system where you're, you're taught that that's true, I think you, you can, that stands out a mile off and it, it certainly helps. And, you know, you pick nuance. When I first started reading the Bible, uh, and it was, you know, I was, things didn't make sense. The Garden of Eden story didn't make sense. The, the serpent didn't lie. God may have lied. It certainly insinuated that it, it lied, even though it doesn't say it outright. Uh, and that just, was just the complete opposite of what, what was kind of taught it, as Christians, to talk to people as Christians who I'd talked to, uh, who said the serpent's a devil and he lied to Adam and Eve. No, he didn't. And, and I didn't have that bias to kind of come into that. And I read that and I read it kind of uh, at first without any kind of knowledge of the, uh, how the text was formulated or who, who was writing it or possibly writing it or anything. I was just reading it as a text and a lot of stuff was standing out that I'd heard Christians say, so, so, no, that's just wrong. Why do you believe that? You know, the gods forgetfully puts the rainbow in the sky after the flood because he is forgetful. It's, it's, it's a, 
it's a ribbon round the finger. It's a piece of string round the finger to remind him not to do it again. God is forgetful, so how can he be all, have all knowledge? <laughs> and, and just stuff like that just stands out when you're not coming from that indoctrination point of view. Just obvious, mm. easy, obvious stuff stands out that everybody should know, and people don't because they're so deeply indoctrinated. Yes. That put always the rainbow there because he's secretly gay. <laughs> That's <laughs> the real reason. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler, guys. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure God is non-binary. I remember very clearly hearing that God does not have a gender. I'm just throwing that out. I know there. he's queer. I'm pretty sure yeah. they're queer. They are queer. <laughs> That's what I learned in religious private school. So I'm just saying. I'm not saying, but I'm just saying. I'm saying if you follow the if you follow the evidence, <laughs> yeah. evidence, and I use that loosely. <laughs> yes. Sorry, uh, this is the true. type of tangents we go on. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. It happens. We get on tangents. But Helen and I get together. It, it just it's tangents. It's all over. It's tangents <laughs> on tangents. Okay, but we did have a related follow up question to that one, which I will now ask because uh, this is a serious program. Um, so, in your opinion, what effect does this kind of unbiased, or you know, as unbiased as possible, um, academic education of religion have on people's beliefs? On, on religious people's beliefs. Is yeah, that... I guess the question is getting at, um, is is there a difference if you study uh, the religious texts from an academic perspective rather than from a spiritual one or from like learning from your minister? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, we touched upon this a little bit earlier on that there are different ways to read and, and understand the Bible and... Uh, the the more of those ways you learn, the the more informed you're going to be, and that's going to give you a completely different perspective than than what you're taught from the pulpit. A lot of ministers, I I've spoken to ministers uh, of non denominational uh, sects sects. I don't know if that's the word. Schools of 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 Christianity, where. Uh, where the, they don't seem to have any knowledge of the academic background. It depends which, which uh, you know, I, I, I got given a, a Church of England vicar, it was, is a friend of mine, and she gave me a, a really good book called uh, An Introduction to Christian Theology, which is given to kind of uh, vicars when they're learning, you know, the first going in, it's part of the, the kind of literature they're given to help them along and that's a really really good book and uh yeah so i think that's by alistair mcgrath uh and that's a you know a christian book obviously given to written by a christian believer given given to people who want to become vicars so it's it's obviously all religious uh oriented but it, it gives them a different perspective and and that's good that they're going into that and ministry and the learning the actual some of the academic stuff behind it, rather than just as as some non denominational non denominational uh, preachers do, just kind of using the Bible to inform them. Uh, and so, yeah, it's uh, if 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 you are a religious person, reading more of the academic stuff is going to inform you and give you a, a different opinion. It may not change your beliefs. Uh, in a lot of cases, it does. A lot of cases, uh, people become atheist because they start reading the academic literature, and it doesn't make sense to them. From but I, su I suppose that's an indi on depends on the individual and what kind of background they've come from and what what school of religion where they're based. You know how much they're indoctrinated. All that stuff applies to that. It's never a one size fits all answer in these things. Yeah, of course that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. All right. Do we have another question, Helen? We do. So most faiths believe you cannot study the test on your own, but need a teacher from within the faith. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think from a, a religious perspective, that is pretty much a universal teaching. I don't know of any any faith off the top of my head that doesn't say that you need a teacher within most of them also say that you 
to a lesser or greater extent, depending on which which particular school of that faith you're part of, will say that you're not to associate with people from outside of the faith to a greater or lesser extent, whether that's getting not just from getting knowledge to them or, or some of them will say don't associate with people at all who are, who are from outside of your faith. Uh, you know, you shouldn't form friendships with people who aren't Christian or Buddhist or uh, Muslim or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, the, I think universally they will all say you should listen to the uh, the teachers and other members of the faith to inform you. And do you agree? Well, no, I don't agree. <laughs> I think it's part of an indoctrination uh, uh, process that, uh, uh, you know, you, sh you should only listen to your teacher. You know that there's only there's only one answer as to why that is, and that's because mm -hmm. they don't want you getting information from elsewhere. They want mm -hmm. you to think that they are right. Yeah, yeah, that is a major red flag to me as well. <laughs> when someone says, "Oh, you can't possibly understand this on your own," okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, now I'm suspicious. <laughs> yeah, my my ears are perked up. Okay. <laughs> So we've got another question here, um, wondering, have the recent years of tension and stress on the world scene in general affected the types of conversations that you've had with religious people? And do you feel that people are doubling down more nowadays on their beliefs and opinions? Ah, that's hard to answer. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think... I'd like to say yes, but I think that's just because of the number of conversations that I have uh, rather than, uh, but if, I, if, if I'm honest and I think back even to when I first started having conversations, uh, you know, if I take, for example, talking to a Muslim in, in the streets of Sheffield when I was 14 years old who had a stall there, those conversations haven't changed much over the years. As, you know, I said earlier on in the show that, you know, we you know, you can have the same arguments over and over again for the millionth time. I don't. So it, it's a hard, I, I have more frequent conversations now, so I get more different perspectives. And so, mm, but I, I think overall, they're probably the, 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 using the same arguments, using the same conversations. Mm. Hmm. That's do interesting. You think, yeah. Do you think it's like, because, you know, there's so much pushback um, against, you know, there's because there's a lot more people, especially um, protesting and they're voicing more, especially those not even like atheists, just people that don't want religion being a part of like any sort of governmental structure, you know, and I think, do you think that like religious people are just feeling much more threatened now and that's why they're, there's so much pushback against that right now? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm in the UK, so it's it's a different situation. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I have no idea what's happening in America. It's crazy. How, no, how you can, how you can even have, <laughs> how you can even have the consideration uh, from any perspective whatsoever that creationism is equally as valid as evolution to be taught in schools and it gets at any stage where it's considered that that can happen is is just beyond me uh you know it's, it's i don't understand america <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the club <laughs> i listen we live here we don't understand we don't. We don't <laughs> get it. <laughs> no explanation <laughs> okay let's so see we already else. kind of answered this question which was about yes. um you know, religious people being kind of stuck in an echo chamber. So I'm going to kind of modify this question because we kind of already answered it. What advice would you give a skeptic to not get stuck in an echo chamber? <laughs> Just check yourself. Just to, if I think for me personally, I can only answer for me personally. If I, I become aware of when I'm being biased and I become aware of when uh, I may be using a bad argument or or parroting somebody somebody else, and you've got two choices when you become aware of that. You can either continue doing it and ignore it, in which case you're stuck in an echo chamber, 
or you can modify yourself and look at yourself and ask yourself why you're doing that. And I think that's just be aware of, of don't just blindly go into conversations or, or if you're thinking to yourself, just blindly think to yourself, you know, I am right. You know, ask yourself, why am I right? Why does this make sense? Why does it, you know, we, we have to ask the same questions as the religious people who were trying to get to use skepticism. You know, it's no good telling them one thing and us doing another thing. You've got to ask yourself the same questions because we're all human beings and we're all prone to the same mistakes. Mm. That is a great point and leads yeah. perfectly into our final question for the Q&A, uh, which is uh, speaking of common straw man arguments, what is the most common or you can adjust it to be the most irritating or uh, notable uh, straw man argument that you have heard atheists use towards Christians? Oh, God. Uh I'm trying to think of the one that was, I had a great big argument the other week. It was funny because I was actually on vacation and I had a really intermittent internet access. And every time I went onto the internet, I just found myself replying to this same atheist guy who would kind of come up. I can't remember the argument he used. It was something along the lines of, uh, God can't be all knowing and something or other. I can't remember the details of it, but it was a total straw man of the of the Christian position. And the whole argument was say, me saying that's not the case. That just that's just not an argument. You just all you're doing is you're building this fantastic argument that you think's amazing, and it, it just doesn't work. Uh, but I don't know. There's there's so many where where you can you could do it on almost any subject if if you. If you decide to speak for somebody rather than listening to what they've got to say, then it's pre you can be pretty assured that at some stage you're going to straw man that person. You know, don't street speak for people. Ask them what they believe. Don't go to a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist and say, right, you guys believe this, and I, uh, you know, I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Ask them what they believe. And that's where the conversation starts. And that's how you avoid straw man in someone. Ask, ask them and listen to them. Listen to what they say. Because just because somebody is a Christian, it doesn't mean they've got the same opinion as the next Christian. So it's very, very easy to create a straw man against somebody by going in and saying, you believe this. Don't do that. That's wrong. That's very, very naughty. And I don't like it. Don't do it. Oh, you say that in that that voice. My goodness. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent points uh, for us this evening. And that is a great, uh, a great point to end on as well. I appreciate that perspective that you brought to us this week and turning it back on ourselves too and holding ourselves accountable to the same things that we expect from other people. It seems fair to me. And those were really wonderful points. So thank you for sharing that with us, Richard. That was fantastic. I am so glad we had you on this evening. And we are looking forward to continuing the conversation. If you have a little bit of time to stay for the hangout after we wrap up. Excellent. Definitely. Yes. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, we will do that shortly then. Um, but as y'all know, this is not the last RFRX episode that we're going to have. We'll be back again next week. And back by popular demand, we'll be having returning guest speaker and professional counselor, Janice Selby. Yay! Yay! I wait. She'll be joining us to discuss life after purity culture. And she's going to share some news about some exciting upcoming events and projects to keep an eye out for. So if that is a topic you are interested in you do not want to miss next week even if it's not a topic you're interested in janice is cool so join us next week for that and as we mentioned earlier most of our previous rfrx recordings um up to 94 of them now are on our youtube channel so check them out there let me drop a link in the chat and uh, we have even more as the audio podcast that gets updated a little bit more regularly as well. So check us out wherever your finest podcasts are found. And don't forget to send us questions, comments, inquiries, death threats, whatever you got for us at 
our email rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org and don't forget the blog and the podcast and helen can you explain because flying spaghetti monster knows i cannot the social medias yeah so you know um social media engagement is really really helps us out um if you if you want to have also more conversations and engage with people in our community please go to our facebook page and you can connect with us there you also you'll see like posts and stuff like that that you could share on your facebook page and piss off your religious uncle <laughs> so um if you need to, we also have a support group so if you need additional support online join our online um support group on our facebook page also we are on the twitter we are on the instagram we are on the TikTok. so um please engage with all those social media share like ring a bell I don't know, <laughs> just engage. We really appreciate it because that draws people to us that might need our services. Also as well, if you would like to get more stuff in your inbox that does not, it's not some prince in some country asking you for a thousand dollars to send him. If you actually want to get good stuff in your inbox, sign up for our newsletter that will give you information on what's going on with recovering from religion, upcoming projects we have going on. Um, all that type of recovering from religion news that you need in your inbox. So sign up for our newsletter. And now we're going to start closing out. So I'll leave that up for just a few minutes while we have our closing thoughts from the wonderful and amazing Sasha D'Souza. Take it away. Thanks, Cara. Thanks, Helen. And thank you so much, Richard, for, for being here today on behalf of Recovering From Religion. Um, we really appreciate you taking time out and presenting a really uh, balanced, dignified, very respectful discussion. You've helped us in many ways to, to think a lot deeper on these topics. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we appreciate, too, that you got up at midnight to come and present that for us. Um, so thank you so very much. Um, we also know you're a very busy person. As we mentioned in the presentation, there's so many different platforms and projects that you're busy with, and we've put a link to a lot of them in there. We'll be sure to promote your work uh, and the work of your colleagues because you do an outstanding job. And we're very appreciative too that you send so many people to us here at Recovering From Religion. And likewise, we feel that we're able to contribute toward helping people worldwide. So thank you very much for that. Please, everybody, take time to check out all the work that Richard does um, because it's a wonderful contribution to helping us all. Now, as you know, Recovering From Religion is a completely volunteer-run organisation, and we appreciate anybody who might be willing to assist us in any way. If you're in a position where you'd like to help us with any of the different projects that Recovering From Religion is a part of, please feel free to go to the main page and drop us a message. Uh, look for the volunteer tab. You might like to be involved with support groups or on the helpline, or you might like to assist us behind the scenes with some technical or IT projects or anything like that. We're always looking for volunteers. And on that line too, we of course are volunteer run. So we're also volunteer funded. If you're in a position where you'd like to donate toward any of our projects, we'd be very appreciative of that. Unlike church though, there is no expectation. There's no 10% tithing required, but if you are in a position to assist us, please look at for the donate tab on the main page of Recovering From Religion. And one of the other things that really helps us, as, as Helen mentioned as well, is promoting the work that we do here at Recovering From Religion on your various social media platforms. Let people know that we are a safe place. We are a great resource that can assist people worldwide. And we do, in fact, cover countries all over the world. So pretty well, we have people available to support others. So spread the word. Let, uh, let people know about the work that we do here at Recovering From Religion.